The correct answer here is B. If our probability is 0.5, then our logit is going to be, remember our logit is the natural log of P divided by 1 minus P, so that's uh, 1 minus P will be 0.5. We do the natural log of 0.5 over 0.5, that's just the natural log of 1, so that will come out to be 0. If the logit, again, the natural log of p divided by 1 minus p, the, the log odds, is equal to 1.0, what's the corresponding probability going to be? Well, you could use some algebra to solve this. You could also see that in some of the modules I alluded to that there's a little formula to solve this. Uh, that, will, uh, that will give you, if you put in the, the logit where, I, where x is here, that will give you the probability. But we can solve this algebraically. So you would just exponentiate both sides here. That's where we get the exponential in here. We would exponentiate both sides, then you can multiply both sides by 1 minus p, so we would get that p is equal to e raised to 1 times 1 minus p in this case. So p is equal to e uh, minus e times p, and again e raised to 1, I should carry that over. And then we were trying to isolate here what's the probability, so I'm going to do p plus e raised to 1 times p is equal to e. I'm just adding that to both sides of the equation. Then I can divide out here. This is equal to p times 1 plus e raised to 1. And then I can cancel that on both sides of the equation. So there's a little general formula. Again, that, uh, if x is the logit here, you would just plug in e raised to the logit. Uh, divided by 1 plus e raised to the logit. And we've kind of solved that here. If I plug in 1 here, we actually get that that is equal to a probability of 0.73. So the correct answer here is 73%, which is e. An ROC curve with an area under the curve of 50% has absolutely no predictive ability, no better than chance. So an ROC curve with a, an area under the curve of 52% is, is bad. So uh, that uh, C is correct. The model has poor predictive ability. The researchers fit a model here that the log odds of hypertension, that's our binary outcome, is equal to our, our intercept is 0.2 and our slope is negative 0.2 times the sleep duration. This is a, con a continuous predictor. So what does the intercept actually mean here? Well, the intercept alone is only going to be applied when our sleep duration is equal to 0. That will make this whole term go out. So the intercept here represents the predicted logit, the predicted log odds of hypertension for someone who sleeps zero hours per night. Of course, there, it's physiologically impossible to sleep zero hours per night, so this person doesn't really exist. But that is what the intercept would represent. So we're given a uh, logistic regression equation here. The beta coefficient is negative 0.2. That is a direct interpretation as an odds ratio, so we just exponentiate the beta coefficient of negative 0.2. That gives us an odds ratio of 0.82. So C, 0.82, is the correct answer here. So first we have to calculate the predicted logit here. So our predicted logit, again, our intercept is 0.2. We're minus 0.2 times the sleep duration, which here is 6. That's going to give us a predicted logit of negative 1.0. So that's our predicted logit of hypertension. That is the log odds. We have to then convert that logit back to a probability. We can convert to a probability by remembering that e raised to the logit divided by 1 plus e raised to the logit. Yeah, is equal to the probability. So we would just plug in here the predicted logit, so of negative 0.1, or negative 1.0, excuse me, uh, and that gives us a predicted probability of 27%. So somebody who sleeps six hours per night is predicted to have a 20%, 7% chance of hypertension. The correct answer is A. The correct answer is B here. The units for the odds ratios are one standard deviation increases in BMI. So a one standard deviation increase in BMI corresponds to an odds ratio of 2.05. It doubles your odds of breast cancer, so B is correct. Odds ratios can exaggerate effect sizes. They exaggerate effect sizes when your outcome is common. Well, fortunately, breast ca cancer is one of the most common cancers, but it's still not very common. The, uh, the general rule of thumb is if the prevalence is uh, less than 10%, then that's considered sufficiently rare that an odds ratio will 
be close enough to a risk ratio, will be close to a risk ratio. So uh, the correct answer here is B, breast cancer is sufficiently rare that the odds ratio and the risk ratio will be similar. So in this uh, question, we're given two logit plots. And the logit plot depends on the binning. In order to be able to calculate the percentage of people with the outcome, and therefore the logit, the log odds of people with the outcome, you have to bin people in your data set, group them. So I've done two graphics here, one with 12 bins and one with uh, four bins, just to give us a sense of the relationship here. What we're doing in a logistic regression is we are fitting a model where our predictor here is our continuous predictor is the number of menstrual cycles per year, and we're fitting a line with the logit. That's what we do in a logistic regression model. We, lo the, we fit a line, so we have an intercept, and we have a beta, and in this case our, our continuous predictor is the number of menstrual cycles per year. Well, the line is going to be something like this and something like this. Of course, of course neither of these is exact because we can't uh, plot the logit exactly. It depends on the binning. If you just kind of eyeball it, you'll see that um, only on the left graph do we go through 0, through the y, x equals 0, through the y axis. That happens somewhere around 1. It's not going to be, uh, it's more closer on this graph to 1.1, but it's not going to happen exactly there because, of course, when you fit a line, it's not going to go exactly through that point. So uh, somewhere around 1, the correct answer has to be somewhere, an intercept of somewhere around positive 1. Then to calculate the slope, we can use both graphics and just say, what's the change in y over the change in x, roughly here? Well, I'm just sort of eyeballing it. For the first graph, it looks like maybe we go down about 2.5. We're going down, so it's a negative slope. Uh, at the, for the y, and we go from 0 to 12 in x, so somewhere around maybe negative 2.08, somewhere around that for the slope. Uh, for the other picture, we can also estimate again, it's somewhere I'm estimating that it goes down uh, about 1.7 in, X, in uh, y, and x changes from 3 to 12, which is a change of 9. So that also gives us a slope of around negative 0.2. So the correct model here would be about 1 minus 0.2 times x here, which is the number of menstrual cycles per year. So the correct answer would be C. So this picture is showing us potentially interaction, because it's showing us that there's a bigger slope for the people who are not depressed than for the people who are depressed. The dotted line are the depressed people. They don't seem to get as much benefit in terms of a reduction in inflammation uh, as the, uh, depress the non-depressed people do. That's the darker line. The non-depressed people get a big drop in inflammation if they drink occasionally or regularly. So there seems to be a difference in the relationship between drinking and inflammation levels for depressed people versus non-depressed people. That would indicate um, an interaction. But what would the actual proof of an interaction be here? In order to prove interaction, what would prove it here is that the slope for this group would be significantly different for, from the slope for the non-depressed group. So the slopes actually have to be significantly different from one another to prove that there really is a significantly different relationship between those two groups. So the correct answer here is B. So uh, I'm asking you about how these hazard ratios were calculated here. Uh, you these are going to be dummy coded. So o the obese, overweight, underweight is a four-level categorical variable. They're being compared to normal weight women. So we have a four-level categorical variable that we're going to have to dummy code. Uh, if you read carefully, it also tells you that we've been that these have been adjusted for age and education, if you read the top of that column. So you know that your uh, natural log of your hazard rate here is going to be equal to, uh, we're going to have an intercept, plus we have to have a beta for obese, plus a beta for overweight, plus a beta for underweight, and plus we have to also, we're adjusting for age and for education, which are continuous variables. So we would have the dummy coded variable. It's a four level categorical variable, so we need three uh, binary variables in the model to, to, to represent that, plus we're adjusting for age and education. So the correct answer here would be B. So the correct answer here is A. 
uh, we would interpret this odds ratio of 1.59. The reference group here is the normal weight women. This is the relative increase in the rate of dementia, of developing dementia. So women who were obese at midlife had a significant, and this is significant because it does not uh, cross 1.0, the 95% confidence interval does not cross 1.0, so it's a significant 59% increase in the rate of developing dementia compared with women who were normal weight at midlife, and it is adjusted for age and education. So A is correct. One of the key assumptions of the Cox regression model is something called the proportional hazards assumption. And what that says is that the relative difference in the hazard rate between different groups has to be constant over time. We have to have proportional hazards. That hazard ratio, which we're seeing here, can't change over time because we're representing it here as a single hazard ratio. So uh, the answer D here would be correct. The relative differences in the hazard rates between the different weight groups must be constant over time.